thanks to all of you, Fishing the DMV not only hit our goal of 100 Patreon subscribers, we blew way past it. I just want to say, guys, thank you so much for believing in this channel and helping us hit this major milestone. I want to talk to you about future plans. Our overall goal with this channel and our, and our big picture dream is to create a nonprofit that's really run by the people. The nonprofit's going to be focusing on supplemental stocking of our local waterways. We're going to also do boat ramp restoration and facility restoration. There's a lot of boat ramps on the Shenandoah, the Ever Potomac, the James, everywhere that just need a little bit of love and some TLC. We also want to do habitat cleanup days, youth programs, and just so much more. And what's great, a lot of these things will be voted on by the people of what we need to hit next. Now, are we going to be able to change the world with this nonprofit? No, but we can start making a difference in our local community. Now, to run a nonprofit, there's a lot of work, a lot of moving parts. So instead of having to go right off the gate and go door to door for companies looking for donations, we're going to make sure that when this thing gets started, it's homegrown. So what we're looking for is six hundred patreon supporters when we hit 600 patreon supporters that could be tomorrow that could be in two years it doesn't matter because i'll be here that whole time but when we hit 600 patreon supporters we're going to be filing for our 501 c3 to get this thing up and running and we can then go into more details each and every week on the show about what's in store and all the wonderful good that we can do in this fishing community if you would like to become a Patreon supporter and you want to join us on this journey, please feel free to check out the link in the episode description. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all of their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. They'll gain access to our private Facebook group community page where we have weekly prize giveaways and online tournaments and picture contests. And you'll also get private content from me, like the Doc Talk series, where I'll be going through kind of like what I did fishing wise that week. If you are interested in helping us eventually hit this goal of having a nonprofit that's really for the people of this great area, please check it out. Thank you so much. Fishing the DMV is the number one fishing show in our region, reaching thousands upon thousands of avid anglers and outdoor enthusiasts each and every week. As the show continues to grow, we are now actively looking for a company who would be interested in becoming the presenting partner of Fishing the DMV. If you are looking to promote your company to a highly engaged audience, passionate about fishing, outdoor adventures, and conservation efforts in the Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania area, please email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you're a company interested in joining and becoming a part of the number one fishing show that continues to grow in leaps and bounds each and every month, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. Today, we've got a really exciting guest delving back into the world of the co-angler. It's something that we have mentioned on the show in the past, and a really big demographic of the country does co-angling. Uh, so before we get into it, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Look forward to it. Like I said, this is the first time I'm doing something like this, so it should be fun and interesting. So really just just to, to kick off for the audience at home, like how did you get into fishing? Well, I started bass fishing with my father back in the mid nineties. Um, just going to a couple of small local reservoirs here close to where I live. Um, we started out with a simple John boat that we bought from Walmart and a cheap trolling motor and just went bass fishing. That's kind of, that's kind of how it all started for me. And then from there, how did you get into the BFLs and the tournament fishing? Um, really just by watching it on television, you know, tournament organizations, uh, Bassmaster back in the old days, um, the FLW tour back in the old days. And, and it was just something that I wanted to, you know, to try. It's, um, it's, back in the, back in the early two thousands, we belonged to a small, um, fishing club. It was called Smithfield, Smithfield Anglers Club at the time. Um, and me and my dad belonged to them for a couple of years. And that's kind of how I, I started tournament fishing. Wow. And it just, it just progressed from there. Um, you know, learned about the BFLs and 
Toyota series and, you know, things like that from just, you know, the internet, Facebook and magazines and things like that. And just decided to give it a try. Where are you located in the country? <clears throat> I live in Virginia. It's a small, very small town on the Chesapeake Bay called Matthews County. Okay. So you're down there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, in that area is really interesting. I had, um, I had Matt of uh, Ten Rig Custom Ten Rigs out down there in your area, believe it or not, on the show. And mm -hmm. it's interesting, like all the lakes and opportunities there are down there for fishing. Yes, but well, I kind of live in the mecca for saltwater fishing, believe it or not. I live right on the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, from where I'm sitting at right now, the Chesapeake Bay is only about two miles as a crow flies. But hmm. uh, the closest place to go freshwater fishing is a place in Gloucester called Beaver Dam Reservoir. That's an all-electric reservoir. And um, that's like 20 minutes from my house. Oh, wow. How big is that place? 635 acres. It's Damn, owned that's the, bad. It's owned by the county of Gloucester. That's like their water source. Uh, how many lakes are down that way? Beaver Dam is, is, is really the only one that's public. There, there's a few small private farm ponds and stuff. Um, there is a brackish uh, tidal river that's pretty close to my house, about 15 or 20 minutes um, off of the Piankatank River, which is the, the little uh, brackish water is actually called the Dragon Run. Which it's it's like the, the further you go up the Piankatank River, it, it turns into brackish. And it's got some pretty good largemouth bass fishing in it. And believe it or not, it's got a heck of a snakehead population. Piankatank River. And then, guys, and then what we're going to do here, guys, because I'm, I'm interested to know exactly where this is as well. I'll pull up my old mappy map here. The Piankatank River is is a is a river right off of the Chesapeake Bay. So if you see Matthews right there on the map, um, you see the little island off just to the right that kind of looks like a triangle. That's called Glens Island. And to the like hmm. northwest of that island, that that's the start of the Piankatank River. Oh wow! Okay, damn. So if yeah, you go, yeah. if you go up that river. If you were to leave, like, say, Glens Island, it would probably take you, a, it's a 30-minute boat ride. Yeah, you're kind of getting into the heart of the Dragon Run now. Huh. And that, to be honest with you, that is like a, a, a hidden gem in this area. Not a lot of people know about it, but the ones that do know about it, um, they fish it pretty hard. And yeah, you can, you can catch bass year-round. Pretty good chain pickle population. And it's got a uh, bowfin, um, gar. And like I said, it's got a heck of a snakehead population. That's and crazy. And I have actually caught like speckled trout on a, on a couple of docks that we're able to fish up that way. I've actually caught a speckled trout right next to a largemouth bass. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yes. That's and red, freaking and, cool. And redfish as well. Puppy drum, redfish, however you want to call them, depending on what region you live in. But yeah, you can catch those three species right next to one another on the same dock. Okay. That's really cool. That's really yeah, cool. And I, and this it's is Beaver a cool Dam, right? Place to fish. Yes, that's Beaver Dam. Oh wow, that's a that's a nice little lake too, huh? <clears throat> this is all in that peninsula. Okay, so you're right near Williamsburg. Gotcha. So then you yeah. you have you fished Little Little Creek Reservoir and yeah, <clears throat> um, as far as the all electric schedule for Rip and Lips Open Series, we always fish Little Creek. We fish Dyaskin Reservoir, Beaver Dam, Chickahominy Lake, and we're starting to vent. Well, they've been doing it for a few years now. They venture out to a bunch of lakes in Suffolk like Lake Prince, Western Branch, Mead Cahoon. Those are on the schedule as well. Hmm. I mean, and let's definitely, let, let's talk about that first to get into it. Is How did you get into the electric motor only stuff? Well, I gotten out of bass fishing, I don't know, probably close to 10 years ago now. And I, t I took like a five-year break from it. And I got back into it about four years ago. Um, a buddy of mine that I work with at FEDOT, I work for the Virginia Department of Transportation. He actually... It's a pretty, you know, he's been into bass fishing for a while. And and I started going with him and just kind of got back into it. And um, I found the electric series is a good way to get started back into it, to kind of get, you know, acclimated back into tournament fishing and fishing in general. So I just shot a message to Jason and Melissa on uh, their Facebook page, you know, asking to come to a tournament and watch them weigh in to see how it was done and liked what I saw. And, uh, the following season, I put a post on Facebook. I actually, was on Rip and Lips Open Series page, looking for a a boater that you know somebody that had a boat. I don't own a boat, and you know somebody that was looking for a co angler, and that's how I got hooked up into it. Hmm, 
That's really cool. Yeah, I, I think we don't really appreciate how many electric motor only lakes there are in the state of Virginia that you can really run a big tournament organization. And and this is a side note because I know nothing about this and we're going to go on a little side tangent. Uh, okay. Before we uh, before we recorded, uh, I was looking around at just different bodies of water and stuff uh, since I know you do the electric motor only thing. And when I was looking on a map, let me pull this back up here. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, I didn't realize like you have these mm -hmm. massive reservoirs down near Norfolk, Virginia. Like, are, mm -hmm. are these public? Yeah, that those I can't see your map real well, but those look like some of the lakes in Suffolk, like your Mead, Cahoon, Western um, Branch. Western Branch is one that we fished. Uh, we we and we do fish quite a bit on the Rip and Lips Open series. The, how, how do they fish these kind of places? Are they like really pressured? Are they kind of like hidden gems, so to speak? No, they, I don't think they receive too much fishing pressure. They do get fished quite a bit, like everywhere else does nowadays. Um, but they they seem to sustain it very well. I know it took when we was at Rippin when we was at Western Branch last year. It took me and my Rippin Lips partner were actually second in that tournament, and we had just a little over twenty three pounds, and it took almost twenty five pounds to win. Wow. But we were there, you know, the prime time of the year. And most of the fish were on the beds. But those those lakes down in Suffolk are notorious anyway for having better than average largemouth population. Hmm. So you really you most any time of the year you really have to have a nineteen pound plus bag to really do anything for an electric motor only lake. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. And not to get off on a side note, but you're thinking no, go for like it. Um, some of these all electric motors that we ran or that we run are almost like outboards. Um, I know the boat that I fish out of, he runs an electric motor called a Carvin, hmm. which is a motor that comes out of Russia and running it on 36 volts. It's almost like having a 9.9 .9 gas outboard. That's insane. Um, with me and my partner with the front trolling motor on and the, the back motor on, we were running close to eight miles per hour. Whew. Wow, that's and, that's and, crazy. And, and there are a couple guys in the club that do run over eight miles per hour. With these tournaments, are they five fish limits, six fish limits? What are they? They're five fish limit, and they have to be over twelve inches unless it's noted otherwise. But all the places that we go are twelve. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. That's dude. That's insane. Like, what what are some of your favorite places to go during the tournament season? <laughs> really, all of them. Um, I, I don't dislike any one more than the other. As long as I get to go fishing, um, it doesn't really matter to me at all. My favorite place would have to be Weston Branch because that, that was just an epic day that me and my partner had. Um, the last fish that was caught that day was caught by me. It was a 654, and that actually called it a four-pound, 10-ounce largemouth. You, mm. don't get many, you don't get many days like that where you can call four-pounders. What is the fishing like there? Is it like deep and clear drop shot? Is it flipping like standing timber? What kind of flavor is it? Uh, all kinds. You got deep, you got shallow. The way we caught him that day was I caught most of my fish on a wacky rig. Um, my boater caught most of his on a shaky head. Um, we caught every one of our fish in like six feet or less. Wow. That's but insane. It was, again, when we were there, it was, you know, the early part of the spring when it was like, you know, pre-spawn spawning. So I would imagine in the summer months, you know, the fish would move out deeper and it's a, it's a fairly deep lake. We saw holes that were 40 and 50 feet deep. Holy shit. That's a big lake. I mean, it was so weird. Yeah. And this is something I would love the DNR to kind of talk to me about is why is it one lake looks like it's 5,000 acres and it has a motor restriction and another mm -hmm. one is 200 acres and has a motor restriction. Like the, the motor restriction things don't make sense. <laughs> well, the, well, the cool thing down there is you can run a gas powered motor, but I think it has to be a, it's a 9.9 .9 limit. Ah, okay. Interesting. That's just something, the, the lakes are owned. Don't hold me to this Thomas, but I think the yeah. lakes are actually owned by the city of Norfolk as like their okay. water source. So it's like three or four lakes that are like connected together by dams. Like um, Mead Cahoon is um, connected by dam. So you essentially have two lakes there. Me, uh, oh. Western branch is connected to Prince Lake Prince by dam. So they're all kind of like right there nestled together. It's like four or five lakes into one, really. I wonder why they did that. I'm going to have to have somebody on to talk about that. That's interesting because you could basically have a, a pretty nice size lake if you just had the one thing. 
Huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what their what their reasoning was behind that, but and it's crazy. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's crazy too. Each you know they're all four or five right there in a the cluster, but they they fish very different. Hmm. Um, I know like Mead and Cahoon. Cahoon is is you know notorious for like stumps and standing timber, where right across the dam you have Mead, which is you know, your, your typical shallow water cover and, you know, your offshore humps and points and things like that. Interesting. But the only thing, the only thing that separates them is a dam. That is so cool. How you can have so many different diverse fisheries so close together. And with that said, how long have you been fishing with ripping lips? Uh, this year will be my fourth year with them. Oh, wow. That's insane. Yeah, I, I, the electric motor thing, guys, I'm going to be covering a lot more this year, Ripping Lips. There's so many other series. Russ has a good series as well. I think he's coming out with. Um, so, yeah, it's just so many cool opportunities to fish. It doesn't just have to be a big bass boat. And with that said about the big bass boat stuff, the co-angling scene, you, you mentioned you're doing the Ripping Lips series. You're also doing a little bit of co-angling this year, correct? Yeah, I'm fishing the BFLs. Well, I'm fishing one whole division, and that being the Shenandoah division. Um, and I'm also fishing the James River Piedmont Division Tournament. And the reason I chose the Shenandoah over, you know, fishing the whole Piedmont Division was it's, it's mostly rivers. And I'm a, I'm a tidal river guy. I love fishing tidal rivers. So it sets up pretty well for me. Getting into that, if an angler wants to get into co-angling, I mean, let's just do a little, like, I guess, co-angling 101. What would you, if you had to put on like a, a seminar to talk to mm -hmm. a, a kid that wants to co-angle for the first time, how would you go about mm -hmm. doing it? Um, talk about a lot about spinning rods, <laughs> um, drop shotting, wacky rigging, shaky head, you know, um, that's probably the, the top three right there. Get, get to know those techniques really well. Cause, um, the BFLs that I have fished, I've been pretty fortunate. The guys that I have fished with have been absolute hammers and they don't leave much in a way for you to throw at or catch fishing behind them. So, uh, you know, the drop shot, the wacky rig and the shaky head, you know, you can, you have a pretty good chance of picking up what they left. It's interesting. You mentioned that because as a co-angler, you are pretty much at the mercy of whatever your boater wants to do for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And so I, it makes sense that the techniques that you're going to be using, they got to be pretty versatile because you don't know really where you're going to go and what you're going to be dealing with. And you're probably fishing for fish that have been already beaten up. Yeah. Well, the cool thing about fishing in the BFLs, it's a, it's a, it's a draw tournament. So you don't know who you're going to be fishing with until the night before the tournament. So what happens is usually around 530 or 6 o'clock, you'll get, a text from major league fishing that tells you who you're going to be fishing with the next day. And that includes, you know, the guy's name, the boat number, what time you do back in the way in. And it also gives you his phone number. Well, either you or him will call one another and kind of discuss what the next day's plans are going to be. And one of the main questions you always ask is what do you think you're going to be doing tomorrow during the tournament? And that kind of helps you set up, you know, as far as how you rig your rods, what you bring as far as tackle, because that's limited. You can only bring, so, you know, so many rods and, you know, you can't bring all your tackle. So you got to kind of condense down what you think you're going to be needing for that day. That makes, that, that makes a lot of sense. So before you go there, uh, you're doing the tournament day. How much tackle mm -hmm. are you bringing with those techniques? <clears throat> Uh, I can, I can fit a lot in, into a, into a very small bag. You would be surprised. I have a small bag that I carry five planos in. Um, I get the, I, I get the tackle bag. Well, I got the tackle, tackle bag from tackle warehouse and they have Plano 3700 style tackle boxes in it. And you would be surprised how much you can put in those boxes. And as far as like soft plastics goes, there's compartments, zippered compartments on the side of the bags where I put my soft plastics in, my scale, my cold tags, pliers, anything else I may need, bottle of water. So I'm trying to think a way for people that are listening on Apple or iHeart to kind of uh, visualize this. So you're talking about three or four boxes. I mean, I'm assuming you're not taking your whole a boat's worth of tackle, correct? No, I, I, I have a small, literally have a small tackle shop in my, in, in my shed where I keep my stuff. And um, no, it was, 
it, the best thing to use is, is kind of a fishing backpack. If you've seen those on like tackle warehouse or at Bass Pro Shops or, or Green Top or somewhere like that, that's that's the way to go. Um, but yeah, it's a very small tackle box. It might be 14 by 14 by 14. It's not real big at all. And I think that's important because I've, I've had, I've, I'm a boater. I've had a co-angler before and I've always wanted to know, like I've had some people that only bring like two rods and, and one or two mm-hmm. you know, pieces of tackle. And I have other guys that mm-hmm. would bring 38 rods and two full bags of tackle. Like they're just disposing of a dead body. And right. I, I feel personally like that's a little bit of an overkill to bring on, on the boat yeah. with me, but I, I, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm wrong. I want to say, don't hold me to this. I want to say major league fishing has a rod restriction of eight rods. You do not need nowhere near that many rods. Um, typically I take four or five. That is plenty. Um, my AirPods just showed up as 20%. I hope they don't go dead. Um, so I take like four or five rods in that one tackle box and I have more than I ever need. So if it wasn't a sanctioned MLF event, would you still be like four or five rods is plenty to take if you're going to be on someone else's boat? If I, if I'm fishing a ripping lips tournament with my partner, um, normally I bring about this, I'll bring the same tackle box with about the same amount of tackle, but I might bring seven or eight rods just because I have a, um, a place where I can put my rods in his rod box. Oh, you're going to put them in the rod box. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. With the spring season coming uh, with, with the spring Mm -hmm. season coming, what would you consider like the, of those three techniques or four techniques that you you stated earlier, which Mm -hmm. would be your go-to that you want to have tied on first? Number one, wacky rig. Number one, first time, every time. Why? Uh, I just have so much confidence in that bait. Mm. It really is and a very I good may, bait. I may carry, yeah, and I may carry like three or four different colors with me until I find the right one. But it's your basics, you know, like your green pumpkins, your June bugs, um, black and blue. You know, I can you can catch fish on those three colors anywhere in the country. Hmm. That's interesting. And second choice would probably be a shaky head. Oh, a shaky head. Why that? Mm-hmm. Well, Why? I do shaky head. I do, <laughs> I do shaky head. Me and my, and I learned this from my rip and lips partner. We have, uh, it's a shirt, certain type of, of worm and shaky head that we use. And he's taught me how to use it. And I can take it anywhere and catch a fish when it seems like nothing else works. I have hmm. that much confidence in it. And it's no secret. A lot of guys know about it. But why the shaky head versus a jig or a drop shot, something like that? I, 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 a jig, I don't fish a whole lot. Um, I do not very much. Um, I just have, that's like my top two techniques. I just have that much confidence in it. If you're So really the techniques that you're describing right now really are kind of, you know, vertical presentation something you're gonna throw out let it go to the bottom uh you're gonna get it on the Mm -hmm. fall with with the wacky worm of course do you have any kind of moving baits that you're gonna be throwing or is it predominantly you're gonna fish those two techniques because you're fishing behind somebody predominantly i'm gonna fish those two techniques behind if i'm especially if i'm fishing behind somebody because i can pretty much bet that i'm I'm gonna get a fish or two on it whether it's to help out my partner at at the at the ripping lips tournament or you know to try to fill my bag at a bfl um, really the only moving baits I throw a lot are top orders, you know, first thing in the morning, you know, like a buzz bait, mm-hmm. a, a walking bait is my number one top order bait. And then the popper will be behind that. And I do throw, I do throw the crank baits. It's, it's all situational. If my, if my boat, if my boater is, you know, offshore, I may throw like a, like a DT 10 or a DT 16 or something like that. But, um, I will throw a Carolina rig a lot in deeper water. Really? I haven't heard someone talk about that in a long time. Yeah. If you, if, if your boater is, is offshore, um, a Carolina rig is a good way to go. 
What is a place that you really don't like to co-angle? I mean, I think like a big grassy fishery is fantastic because you can pretty much cast anywhere and have success. Is there a place though that you'd be like, ah, this yeah. is really frustrating to be a co-angler? I think I think your your places, your lakes, like a like a Bugs Island or a Smith Mountain Lake or Lake Norman, uh, anywhere like that, where most of your boaters are going to be offshore or using that live scope fishing the brush piles the points and things like that, where they kind of put you at a disadvantage. Um, that's to me, that's where a Carolina rig comes into play because I can throw that Carolina rig, you know, and essentially drag it behind the boat and pick up a fish or two. So, I mean, they're not, they're not my, they're not my least favorite places. It's just a place where we go, where we as co-anglers don't really expect a whole lot because yeah, the boat is going to be looking at that live scope, throwing at that brush pile and not giving us that many opportunities to catch. And I'm not against live scope at all. I think it's what do you cool. think with co angling and the boater dynamic? What is good etiquette when you you're going to go out with somebody? You just got paired. What is the etiquette that you kind of try to follow? <clears throat> um, you definitely don't want to cast up towards the boat. You know where he's fishing. Um, just try to be a good net man as you can. Um, uh, it, it, if, if, even if you have a bad boater, fortunately I haven't had a bad boater. All of my boaters have been really, really good. Um, you know, give them a little bit of gas money either at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day and, and, and you know, treat their boat as if it was your own, um, you know, and, and respect all their wishes. I think communication is key is talking to them, making sure you put their mind at ease. Um, don't yeah. overcrowd their boat. That's a big one, depending on the boat that they have. Uh, if, if they got a smaller boat, you know, just be mindful of that kind of thing there. Don't die, striking die, dips and stuff. You know, be careful with that kind of stuff. Uh, if you dump, the yeah, great way to kill a relationship is to dump, spike it, die on their carpet. Uh, so be careful of that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't even take dip it, die with me simply for that, uh, that, that particular reason. My, my AirPods are showing at 5%, by the way. <laughs> and yeah. I charged them up before we started. With looking at co-angling now with, with the world that we're in, with prices going up, and now the ABA is having a series without co-anglers, what is the mm -hmm. fate of co-anglers going on into 2024 and 2025? I think co-angling is going to continue. Um, and I think it's going to continue in a strong way simply because of the cost of, you know, like owning a boat. Um, it, it's much more costly to go out here with a tow vehicle and a boat um, and compete as a boat. So uh, I think it, it's going to continue to be strong. I don't think uh, I don't think co-angle will ever go away. Do you think one day BFLs won't have co-anglers? No, I think they'll continue to have it. I really do. Why? It it just it, it just makes sense. It makes you know the the average person like myself who holds, you know, a a, a regular job, say seven to three thirty, like me, um, who's not in a position to go out here and buy a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar boat on up, you know, to be able to compete as a boater. I, what I worry about is with the prices the way they are, that at some point they're just going to be like, listen, we're going to raise the prices a little bit more. And at that point, it kills co-angling because it's too expensive and not enough people sign up. And then they're going to have to go to, listen, we'll just raise the price a little bit so you don't have to have a co-angler. I think that's the bubble is as prices keep going up. Sadly, I think the first people that'll break will be co-anglers versus boaters when it comes to paying entry fee prices. I could be wrong, but it just seems like that's where the tea leaves are going with everything just getting so expensive. Yeah, and you, it, you could be right. You could be right. Let's hope not for my sake because I really, yeah. really enjoy co-angling. It, it just works out for me a lot better. Yeah, and it's like, I, and, and again, I've gotten some comments on this online and stuff. I'm not saying co-angling will die completely, but... At the Elite Series, co-anglers don't exist anymore. The BPT, uh, you know, the Toyota Series is still around. The Bass Opens is still around. How long will that be a thing for? It, it, because it's getting more expensive. That's the thing is, I don't know. It, to spend that much money to be an open co-angler, it's like, good God, it's a lot. 
it it it's expensive all the way around. It's yeah. just something you've got to you've got to. It, it, I don't want to use the phrase Thomas, but you got to pay to play. Yeah. If you if you want to if you want to do if you want to do you know something like this, you you've got to pay to play. It's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> yes and no. For somebody like me who enjoys it as much as much as I do, it, it, it really it doesn't bother me that much. What tournament is going to be your first tournament of the year? Future, I am. What's your first tournament it's, of the year going to be? Is it Smith? April 6th at Smith Mountain. Yeah, Smith Mountain Lake, April 6th. Oh, damn. What are you, how are you feeling about that tournament? I think my AirPods just died. I don't know. I've only been to Smith Mountain Lake once, so we'll see how that goes. You've only been there one time? One time, and it was probably 25 years ago. Oh, my yeah, God. I haven't um, I haven't had the need to – I haven't had the opportunity to really go out there anymore to uh, to do that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's going to be – it's going to be new. I know the small mouth uh, population there is pretty good, and they've got an awesome large mouth population. So, I think we'll be all right. Yeah, I, I think you're going the to be key fine. Is, the key is is getting a good boat, obviously. Yeah, I've already yeah. got kind of a game plan, you know, to go. Does if you have the ability, does pre fishing help at all? I don't believe so. Uh, I get I get asked that a lot. Um, you know, I talk to my friends a lot that fish, uh, like say the Rip and Lips Open Series. And we do just as much pre-fishing there as we do like a BFL. And to me, uh, uh, to quite honestly, no, I don't think pre-fishing matters. Because yeah, to I... me, the weather and conditions can change a whole lot from the last time you pre-fished to the tournament day. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because if, if you are a co-angler... If at all, it gives you an idea. Go ahead. If um, if I was to go pre-fishing, whoever I'm pre-fishing with might be doing something totally different than what my boater is that day for the NF, you know the BFL. So what I learned in practice might, you know, my my practice might be out in off you know offshore fishing brush piles or something, or points. And my boater for that day, you know, tournament day, he's you know fishing shallow docks brush. Uh, brush piles and things like that so what i learned in practice is basically completely out the door yeah that is interesting because you it, you don't even have a choice honestly when you get there when you're dealing with the boater's decisions is his boat and if you've pre-practiced like it doesn't mean that's what he wants to do and i mean I mean, sometimes i think it would help if you have like an inside edge at a, at a lake that you're really good at you'd be like hey this has worked over here before that I know, that's fascinating and when is your first term for the ripping mm -hmm. lips Uh, that is March 16th. That will be at Diaskin Reservoir in New Kent County. Diaskin Reservoir. I need to find this place. Diaskin Reservoir. Where's that at? Mm -hmm. It's in New Kent County. It's right off of Route 60. Uh, it's very close to the Chicka uh, to Chickahominy Lake, uh, Providence Forge, New Kent area, off of Route 60. Oh, I found it. Oh, wow. That lake is actually that lake is actually owned by Newport News Public Works or Newport really? News Waterworks. Yeah, that's uh, one of their water sources. Oh wow, that place is awesome. <clears throat> that has a really good spotted bass population. What's the fishing like then? Like, is it what? What does it take to win in the springtime? Um, I actually won a tournament there two years ago when I fished with Outcast which is another all-electric series. Me and my previous electric partner, we actually won a tournament there, and I believe, I remember right, it was in June, and we had 1857. Hmm. Um, it typically takes 16 to 18 pounds, you know, to, to get into money. That's pretty good for any like. Yeah. And that's pretty much all year long. And I've seen a, I've seen a couple bags get really close to twenty. And when is that event? That's uh, March sixteenth. March sixteenth. So that's going to be the first mm -hmm. event. Are you going to prefish that? Yes, most likely. Um, 
you were talking about Matt Downs down in Trick Tens down in Norfolk or Virginia Beach. Um, my electric partner actually has his boat down there now getting a full-on build by him. And he's supposed to get that back sometime this week, I believe. And as soon as he gets it back, we're going to start pre-fishing some. Oh, that's going to be freaking awesome. He he does great work. Yes. Um, he's actually put out four videos on his YouTube page of that boat. Um, if you want to check it out, it's a 18 foot rough, low roughneck John boat. And he basically completed it, completely gutted the boat, um, put a whole new top deck on it with a bunch of storage compartments, a custom live well. It's got lights all the way around the boat inside and outside of the rails. Um, it's completely wrapped in uh, like a blue cryptic camo pattern with some, uh, large mouth bass on the side of it. And the name of the boat is called game changer. That's a, did you guys come up with that name? Actually, my, my, my partner, my boater came up with that name. That's really freaking cool. Did, how how pressure, like when we think of like, let's say a lake is a great example, a decent amount of pressure there. Will fish in these smaller bodies of water, do they kind of have the same amount of pressure to them? Are they, are they that finicky or is it, <clears throat> is the fishing generally speaking better? No, gen generally those places get hit pretty hard. Um, and, and you can definitely see the pressure there versus a bigger body like a Bugs Island or Smith Mount Lake or something like that. They do get hit really hard in this area. Hmm. Especially so fishing would be better at Kerr. Interesting. Not, not, nice. not necessarily. Um, you know, Kerr has its time and place and, you know, like Diaskin's a little Creek reservoir has its time and place. Early season is always good. Because, you know, in the wintertime, they get, you know, they get a break from getting beat up every weekend. So, you know, spring, they start to get beat up a little bit more. And as summer progresses, they get harder and harder to catch because they're getting beat on so much. It is interesting if there's something to be said for these lakes where they shut down for four or five months, if that's actually a good thing. Yeah, you, we, st we still get out and, and fish a little bit during the, during the winter months when it is cold, but it's very weather dependent. Do any of these lakes uh, shut down? Because I know like Hunting Run Reservoir, places like that, they do close. No, um, I do know in the past two or three years, Little Creek Reservoir, which is actually in Tarana, Virginia, it's about a 15-minute trip from Diaskin. Um, they have had problems the past two or three years with the lake dropping real low, water level-wise. Mm -hmm. And they'll typically close it down in late fall and all through the winter, and they'll generally open it up back like in February or March, somewhere in that time frame. Interesting. But That's most, another place. Most all, of, most all of them stay open year round. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. That's another place that's on my bucket list is to get down right into there into the coast because the fishing there is just, there's just so many fishing opportunities. It's crazy. Yeah. And if you go to, if you go to Little Creek, which is in Toana, um, um, they have a really cool striped bass population in there as well. Really? Yes. I, I didn't know that. That's, that's insane. Wow. Okay. I didn't know they had striped bass. What's your biggest bass ever? Um, document it is eight three. That hmm. came out of Chickahominy Lake. That's not bad at all. That's Chickahominy Lake sure is another place. A couple, yeah, that um, that place can be a feast or famine. That can be either really good or it can be really really bad. That place gets hammered. Absolutely hammered. How, how big is that place? I'm not sure the exact uh, acreage on that, but it's a pretty good sized place. Mm. It's actually a part of the Chickahominy River system. And, you know, there's a dam that separates it right there by Rock a Hot Campground. That's a place that we need to do an episode on. So if you're a listener and you're from that area, please let me know. Uh, we could do a, uh, a fishing report on that place, Chickahominy Lake. Pull this up right now, guys, for you. <clears throat> I would dare say Chickahominy Lake is probably a couple thousand acres at least. Let's see. Chickahominy Lake is, drum roll please, based on the Department of Wildlife Resources. Uh, let's see. Chickahominy Lake is a 1,230-acre water supply reservoir located along New Kent, Clark City. 
One thousand acres. That's not bad. Again, this is what drives. It's just so crazy. It's like so. This place is one thousand acres, but you can basically use your outboard, no issues. And then you go to somewhere else in the in the same state, and a thousand acres, and you have to only use a trolling motor, or potentially, you know, you have an outboard restriction. It just it doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent, I guess. Wow, that's really cool. Something messed up that feed there for a minute. I lost you about five seconds. Uh, you're good. I was just talking about uh, there's a really cool lake, and that's a place that we definitely need to hit a, a little bit more on this show. Um, Brian, like, really, the last thing I really want to bring up is kind of what are your favorite setups, uh, rod and reel wise, for the shaky head and for the wacky rig? <clears throat> well, I use exclusively Kistler rods out of Magnolia, Texas. Um, I'm on their promotional staff. So all of my rods and reels are used by them. Um, I really use, for the wacky rig and shaky head, um, I use, basically I use one rod. It's a seven foot medium action spinning rod um, with a 2500 series Kistler spinning reel, series one spinning reel. And I fish it on 10 pound, 10 pound test fluorocarbon. And it's the same thing for uh, pretty much standard for all your setups? Yep. Uh, I have two spinning rods that I take with me everywhere I go. One is a medium action. The other one is what they call a light, medium, heavy. It's not quite medium heavy, but it's a little bit heavier than a medium action. It's just got a little bit, you know, a little bit more tip to it. Um, I will use that sometimes, but most of the time it's just a, a medium action rod with a fast action. And I can just, I, I can keep that rod in my hand all day. And if I want to go to shake your head, I just cut the wacky rig off and tie a shake your head on and just keep on fishing. Yeah, and having that versatility is so important, especially when you're in the back of the boat. Uh, it, it, you don't want to take too much where it's just going to become a hassle for you. Now, do you do any kind right. of doubles? Like, so example is two or three of the same rod, and you'll rig up a couple of the same thing. That way, in case one breaks, you can keep going. What's your strategy there? Yeah, so what I, what I do is like a BFL tournament. I'll try to take four rods. Sometimes I'll take five, depending on if I'm fishing like a river with a lot of grass. I'll take that fifth rod and have braid tied onto it. If I'm going to fish like a, uh, like if I'm flipping in pads or weeds or something, and I'll also team it up where I can fish a frog on that as well. Um, so like I'll take two spinning rods with me. Um, both of those are seven foot medium action and I'll take two casting rods with me. One of them is a medium action. So I can work like reaction baits, like your crank baits and your top orders and your things like that. Uh, the next one will be seven foot medium heavy where I can work like other soft plastics or, um, you know, swim jigs, things that will require a little bit heavier rod. That's cool. That's really cool. I mean, Brian, you know, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, talking a little bit about your history, about co-angling and all these electric motor only lakes. Uh, is there any sponsors that you'd like to promote? Yes. I would like to give a big thank you to Barry Cobb. Um, from Moneymaker Jigs. He's out of Chesterfield, Virginia. And if I may, I'll try to show you a couple of the jigs that he has. Mm -hmm. um, he basically sells two jigs. Um, it's that one swim jig right there. Um, and then he sells another another one that's an Arky style jig, which is more for like, you know, you're flipping and you're pitching. Um, that's the two main ones that he sells. And he probably has 10 or 12 different colors in each series. And I think he does like three different weights, like a quarter, three eighths and half. And he also sells um, some chatterbait style baits and he sells skirts as well. And the cool thing about him that I like is when I, when I go buy a jig, the first thing I look for is a hand tied skirt. I absolutely mm -hmm. love a hand tied skirt. I don't like ones with the rubber bands simply because they deteriorate. Um, my second sponsor is Tiger Crankbaits. You know them very well. Um, Heidi and Greg, run a wonderful program at Tiger. Um, I just can't, I, I, I wish I had this kind of talent that Greg and Heidi do, but I don't. Um, two of their, probably the best selling crankbaits are the Blue Crab, which is that one right there. That's just one best in show this year in the, in the hard bait category, I believe, at the Fishing Expo. And the next one was one that won last year at the Bass Fishing Expo was the the Hot Cherry Crawl, which is that one right there. That's probably their, their top two selling baits right there. Wow. And they sell a bunch of different ones 
square bills um, in the one point one point five, the two point five size. Um, they make a um, the Mega Bass S crank one point five. They have a knockoff like of that, and that's right right here. Sorry, I got my tackle box with me, so that looks kind of like that. And hmm. then they make one that's uh, like like the Spro Little John. Um, they have one that looks like the Baby One Minus. Um, and they have they have top water poppers. They have the walking baits. They have uh, lipless crank baits. Um, she does some awesome looking swim baits. She hand ties feather trailers, you know, to go on on the back of like poppers or walking baits. Um, you crank baits from like, you know, all the way up from a wake bait down to, a, you know, like a 16 or 18 foot deep diver. And she'll also repaint baits for you. You know, if you got, you know, another maker and you've got some old crank baits that have been beat up over time, um, you can send them to her and she can paint them pretty much however you want custom colors. They are fantastic. They make some of the best bit crankbaits around. Fantastic artists, really first and foremost, just great artists, honestly. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, they're absolutely hands down some of the best baits. And then as you guys know, you know, we just gave away a couple of their crankbaits uh, about two weeks ago. That, 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 that blue crab was a very interesting design. And I think that's something that we're going to see more of, I think, in the fishing industry is that crab design for these tidal fisheries. Because it's been a while yeah, since that well, was in the rotation. That um that right there out of all of the jigs and crankbaits and everything I've ever seen to mimic a blue crab, when Greg paints that bait, he hits it spot on. I know it might be kind of hard to see there, but Greg does a heck of a job painting that bait. And we sold the absolute heck out of them at the Richmond Fishing Expo. And I know they've done two or three shows since then. And it's the same old hymnal everywhere they go. That blue crab crankbait just sells. Anybody that does any kind of tidal river fishing and you want to throw a crankbait, that's the color you want. 100%. Well said. Well said, sir. Uh, yeah, again. And a couple uh, other people that I. Yeah, go for it. A couple of the other people that I work with, like um, Wiley X, that's a contingency program through, the, through Major League, uh, through the BFLs. Epic Baits is another one. I also work with Drop Zone Tackle, which is out of another small company out of Virginia. Um, they make really cool drop shot weights that have rattles in them. Um, you don't see many, you don't really see any drop shot weights that have rattles in them. And I don't know if you can hear it in my AirPod or not. Yep. But um, yeah, you need to, you check them out. If you want, if you fishing, if you like fishing a drop shot a lot, and you want something that just gives you a little bit more of an edge, get hooked up with Dennis Stump at Drop Zone tackle and check out those uh drop shot weights with rattles on them and they just released a shaky head weight that has the rattles built into them as well i haven't gotten my hands on any of those yet but i will very soon no huge shout out to drop zone and, he, uh, uh, i want to give a big he, i was just gonna say huge shout out to drop zone he came on the show at the richmond fishing expo he's a really cool dude yeah yes he is uh, i want to give a shout out to lynn bell at fishing pro tech he helps me out quite a bit with the especially tackle um that you know it's kind of hard to get like your mega bass and your depths and you know your other high-end stuff he's um he's treated me well over the years and i'm proud to call him a partner that's awesome who I else you got i think that's pretty much it and and kiss and I, can't, I can't thank trey kissler enough at kissler rods for giving me the opportunity to uh to be on a promotional staff um i, can, I can't say it enough you know i can use any rods out there that I want, but whenever I call the, the Kistler factory and I have a question or I want to place an order or something like that, it means a lot to me when the company, when the owner of the company will actually pick up the phone and talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had conversations on the phone with Trey Kistler, you know, that will go 20 and 30 minutes and he treats me, you know, like we're a family. And that means a lot. And he, he sells an awesome, awesome rod and reel. 
Brian, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about here. Uh, if you'd like to, please go check us out on iHeart, Patreon, Spotify, uh, and Apple Podcasts, including our old YouTube channel. If you'd like, go check us out on Patreon. We're super close to hitting our first goal of 100 Patreon subscribers. It'll help keep this show running through 2024. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.